While you're fixing that last little bit of stuff, we'll go around the room and do introductions. Most faces look familiar, but some of them look less familiar than familiar faces. Hmm. And we lost some people to the rust beat up because they figured out they were in the wrong room. Oops. Ah. Little did they know they were in the right room the first time. <laughs> anyway, so we'll start off with Travis. Yep, my name is Travis Barney. I work here at Vivid. I've been in building web stuff since the late 90s. So that's all I know. Good. <laughs> Uh, I just started a new company called Arivo um, up in West Valley. Um, I'm a front end developer, uh, mostly with Vue, uh, but kind of just JavaScript in general. Um, clearly, like Node. I play around with Dino a lot. And yeah, I used to work with this guy. <laughs> yeah. So my name is uh, Joey Novick. Um, uh, I work at Lingo Tech. <coughs> I'm, I'm kind of full stack. I've, I've been in Drupal, WordPress, uh, the back end, Sandra, front end, <coughs> Python for PyTest, so kind of like all over. <coughs> but depending on the time of year, I'd say I'm like, 70% back end, 30% front end. But this this meetup comes uh, highly recommended. So I'm, I appreciate you. Nice, welcome. And for those of us that already forgot, what did you say your name was again? Uh, Joey Hovick. Joey. Yeah. Hello, I'm Jojo. I've been building stuff for many, many years now. Uh, a lot of JavaScript in the past several years, but I've uh, done PHP and stuff over the years. And, uh C-sharp there a little bit. Um, yeah, I'll never go back, but you know. Um, yeah, uh, and I like Rust too, but the one that I was really excited for, uh, the guy canceled today, so. <laughs> no offense. With a glowing recommendation like that, who needs enemies? <laughs> I know. <laughs> like, I was I'm so glad. excited for this one too, and so it was it twisting was, uh, me apart, and then it made it easy. Okay. Yeah. So the Oreo, you don't have to divide the Oreo, you can keep it together. Exactly. I'm Austin, I'm a React guy. You should go over there. <laughs> hey, which is hey, not we need everyone we can get today. Okay? <laughs> Any other day, I'd agree. But today, those who are not our enemies are our friends. Uh, I'm Manuel. I'm also a React guy. But I also do other stuff like uh, some, somewhat full stack, but mostly front end stuff. That's kind of my better part. I'm Kyle. I, I build things. You know, I like. <laughs> Why are you here today? Normally, I would think that you'd pick Russ, but you, you came to us. This one's not more interesting. So. Okay, all right, cool. We got it. We win. <laughs> all right. Um, I'm AJ. AJ. I obviously am a person who um, orchestrates this along with many thanks to Travis and Vivian for hosting for us. Uh, long time JavaScripter. I've got opinions for everything, even things I don't know stuff about. And the best news is they're always right, so. <laughs> no worries there. And then finally, let's introduce our speaker for today. Which I have the slide up for. Right. It's not actually in presentation mode though because of issues. That's okay. That's okay. But I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and actually I'll let you introduce yourself after this. So <clears throat> formally, I welcome you all this evening to Utah Statues. 
And uh, another formal thanks to Vivint and uh, Travis for hosting us tonight and providing us with pizza and goodies. And now we will welcome our presenter, Samuel Skeen, a.k.a. Quadruple Digit. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, for those of you who do not know me, um, I first got started into web back in 2015, back when JavaScript was apparently get, starting to get good. It's always been that way for me, but you know, no. Um, I've definitely written enough of my own, or enough uh, ES5 code. <clears throat> anyway. I uh, first learned how to do web development at Dev Mountain. I finished that same year, 2015, got a job at the beginning of 2016, and have been working professionally in it ever since. I've even gone back, actually, to uh, Dev Mountain to be an after hours instructor so that I can tell people that I know things. Um, but in any case, I've found lots of different fun things just about like how huge of uh, an ecosystem development software engineering is. Um, I've done things for all different kinds of stacks. I don't really know that I would would say that I'm any more prefer. I don't necessarily prefer front or back end more. Both are fun in their own rights. Uh, some people would say fun in quotes because of CSS, but that's my jam. So if you have questions, come to me. Um, which is why I'm talking about a back-end framework today. So, what are we talking about? I know that this presentation was Node, HTTP2, and you. So, short, pithy titles, you know, get people here, right? Um, all one person that was here on purpose. No. <laughs> In any case, what I wanted to talk a little bit about is like why I wanted to talk about HTTP2 in the first place. Um, HTTP2 is kind of an interesting thing. A lot of people don't really think too much about the underlying protocols that they're using because Node takes care of that, Nginx takes care of that, what have you takes care of that. Except for when it comes to HTTP2, in which case uh, they don't. They don't. Not always. It depends. In this case, I actually can say that Node, for instance, actually takes care of HTTP2 by itself, or can, but the framework, ha the, the code that is running your server actually has to use HTTP2, so. But I'll talk a little bit about that in just a second. You can see that I have a very extensive um, slide deck right here, it's wonderful. You can see everything about Everything I'm going to say all in that, that's a wonderful thing about slide decks we have, um, which is why I'm not going to share it after this because it's useless. Um, <laughs> in any case, what, what kind of got me started on this? Well, let me explain. So in, one of, in several of the projects that I've been a part of, there's been some sort of real-time component that needs to be there. Um, there was one project where we had to take uh, user submissions and more or less in real-time start them to show on this canvas. It was like a self-building mosaic project, which is kind of cool, but... <clears throat> um, one of the things, one of the biggest things about it is the fact that you need to send the image up and once it's done processing, it needs to immediately update on the canvas. Um, similar sorts of things have been talked about when it's come to other parts of my projects, which at whatever companies I worked for, um, where like you send a message and somebody gets it immediately. Um, a lot of times when we talk about um, 
real-time communication on the web, aside, aside from WebRTC, we usually end up talking about WebSockets. And for many reasons, WebSockets can actually be a bit unwieldy when you already have a huge ecosystem built up inside of your main web application, the back end. Um, essentially, now you have to figure out a way, because WebSockets doesn't really include natively some way to authenticate um, that this person and say that this person who has the socket is who they say they say they are you don't get some of the other things like you be especially because it's a completely different protocol from um, HTTP it becomes a lot more messy and a little bit harder to deal with I also don't love the old and venerable but still clunky uh, polling strategies that we, uh, that we often use because that's the best thing we can figure out and that's just essentially, oh, in the background, I'm going to call this thing, is there any updates? Is there any updates like every five seconds or how, whatever timeout you have? Um, that has its own problems and is also unwieldy in its own ways. We can still probably field it fairly well, but one of the difficulties becomes that now that's that much traffic for every single user, for every single page that you deal with. And sometimes that's not really something that you can get around. And I mean, there are ways that you could probably decrease that load somewhat, but at the same time, it's not hu usually a huge load, so what have you, it might just make more sense to go with that route. But one thing that caught my eye when I was looking for options for these kinds of things was something called an event source, which is something built into JavaScript. Um, and essentially what it does is it sends a request to a backend through HTTP, unlike WebSockets. And what it does is that it, with that connection, the server handles it and sends back something saying, we're keeping this open. And the server has the ability to push events to the front end without having to destroy and create new sockets. It's through the exact same socket, which is great. Um, <clears throat> but one of the biggest problems that I encountered with that was because of the limitations of HTTP1.x, whatever you want to call it, this screen is not updating if you were going through slides. I am not changing okay. slides. Okay. I am not bothering because it's my the presentation wasn't the slide deck wasn't ready, so Okay. Meh. Alright. I just get to ramble at you for a while until we look at code. Oh okay. Great. So you you get my havering whether you like it or not. Um so HTTP one dot X has problems in one regard where only a certain amount of, because of only a certain amount of connections can be open at a time concurrently to an HTTP 1.x server, you have problems with the fact that if you have an event stream with a socket open all the time, that's one less connection you can have. And especially if you have many tabs open, for instance, to the same site or whatever, you're going to run into problems because the socket is still open, it is taking up that slot, and now you have many sockets taking up the sa those slots. And so you eventually run into problems with the limited number of connections you can have to the server at one time. So while I was researching on what event source, how to use event sources and stuff like that, I found, for instance, on MDN that it says it is recommended for you to use HTTP2, at least. Now we have HTTP3, but that's a story for another day because Node doesn't even support it yet. Um, at least natively in one of its modules. HTTP2 is recommended because one of the defining factors of HTTP2 is the fact that you can have multiplexing on these sockets which means that essentially you decrease the number of connections that you actually need to have to the same server because it's all going through the same socket, essentially. So that's kind of cool. That's great. And 
right now, most of the time when people are using HTTP2, um, when it's not intentional as it were, it's usually because the Nginx is serving up files. And by default, it just does that, or rather, you can configure it to not, or I think by default, early does prefer HTTP2, if it allows for it. But um, in my case, I wasn't actually necessarily wanting to just relegate it to static files. Static files are great. You need them to run the front end at all. But HTTP2 uh, was a better choice in that case for doing these event sources. And the example that I had been trying to get going, which I think will work now, maybe. I did want to ask you a question. You yes. Said, you know, there's this issue with the browser only allows you to open up so many connections. Do you know why that is? Because it seems like, I mean, they're pretty much free. It's just a resource handle. Right. So... Uh, event source. This is actually one of the things that I was going to maybe pull up, but I just didn't get around to before we started talking about that. See, there's this lovely warning saying, when not used over HTTP2, server-side events suffers from a limitation to the maximum number of own connections, which can be especially painful when opening ver various tabs as the limit is per browser and is set to a very low number, six. Hmm. The issue has been marked as won't fix in Chrome and Firefox. Interesting. Since this is limit is per browser and domain, um, that means you can open six server-side event connections across all of the tabs to that, and another six server-side event connections to a different domain. When using HTTP2, the no maximum number of simultaneous HTTP streams is negotiated between the server and the client and defaults to 100, as opposed to that paltry six. So, that's part of the reason why I was looking into HTTP2. HTTP2 in that case was great. Uh, Node, as I mentioned, supports natively HTTP2. All you have to do is bring in HTTP2 um, I can even probably go over to Fluvial and talk about it. So if I were to open up six tabs to the same domain, the seventh one would fail? If it's using the same one, uh, if it's using event sources or oh, server oh, okay, events, okay. yeah. It would fail or it just wouldn't create a new connection? Would it like reuse one of the connections? I don't think it would reuse a connection because it hasn't been uh, released, as it were. Hmm. Are you just getting error? Now I want to test this to see what I know. Is. It's one of those things that's like, well, so you say this, but what really happens? Yeah. That's all that I know, but let's maybe take a look at this. So you can see all of this stuff in my terminal, and that's not great. But you can see Node here has an HTTP2 module. Now, I put the Node qualifier on it just simply because, to me, it reads a little bit better that this is coming from Node and not an NPM package. Uh, that is the recommended way, now, right? I believe so. Okay. And interestingly enough, Dino and uh, Bun, I believe, will both actually honor node specifiers. Um, so it'll actually pull uh, open these things as if they were from node at least. And I, I think that's the reason is because yeah. HTTP2 should be whatever the native HTTP2 is. Mm -hmm. If you want the compatibility, you use the node prefix. And I mean, technically, too, um, like Dino, I was looking into this a little bit, too, because I was thinking of maybe adding this as a Dino package, too, but we'll see what happens with that. Um, I know a lot of people like Oak, which is the basically expressive Dino. So, <clears throat> anyway... In Node, you can see that we have these things. Now, I want to just make it clear that, like, for instance, with Express, it's not written in TypeScript. So technically, the type definitions are separate. If you don't want to use TypeScript, it doesn't really matter because since I'm using TypeScript, I can actually build the 
uh, definition files, so you don't even have to even think about the fact that there's technically TypeScript under the hood. Anyway, but that also means that it's slightly more reliable than getting something off of uh, definitely typed. Anyway, that's beside the point, but that's actually what these things are. These are just type imports, so you can ignore them. But here, I'm using this create secure server, or as many who might have played around a little bit with node HTTP1, um, or HTTPS or whatever, servers, is it's the same kind of API there. Um, in my case, I don't actually create a server unless, or until you go to actually listen, which to me just makes sense personally. But the idea is that um, it more or less takes it from there. So given that, it looks like it's very easy to implement something like this up front, right? Well, um, I don't know. To, to explain a little bit again. What? So like in HTTP 1, create servers the exact same kind of API, you give it a handler the, with the rec and res and do stuff in the, that function and then uh, send a response back when you're done, right? Yes. If you're familiar with Express, for instance, that's exactly what it does. And for that matter, you can actually take an Express application and plug it straight into a create server because that's all that it needs. However, <clears throat> one of the biggest difficulties and the, actually the reason why I found Express doesn't support HTTP2 is because HTTP2 is handled much differently than HTTP1. You might use it in some of the similar ways, but one of the biggest differences is that like um, in an HTTP1 An HTTP one request message. I'll zoom in a little bit here. You can see right here how it says put slash create page and then HTTP one slash one dot one. Then comes the headers, then comes the body. HTTP two doesn't exactly work that way. Instead they have, uh, I can't remember what the right term is called, but they have headers that are prefixed with a colon, which is kind of weird because most of these headers are suffixed with a colon, header keys are suffixed with a colon. But that just means that now there's a colon at the beginning and at the end, because the one at the end is just saying that this is the end of the key and the rest is the value. Um, so there's a method header. So you don't have that big put at the beginning it's colon method, colon, put. Same kind of thing goes for the path. It's, I can't remember, is it colon, path, colon, I think, and then path? And I thought they used single letter nope. for the common things. That, when I go to the Chrome inspector, that's the way it looks. Uh, we can take a look actually over here. If we open up this and refresh this page. Which we will Can get to. Zoom, zoom in and enhance. I'll oh, zoom no. in that part. There we go. And I'll get rid of the console, fine. So, when we go to actually look at these, we can see over here that we have headers. Um, first of all, I guess I can point out that it says protocol is H2, which is the ALPN protocol uh, version for H2. Whereas like HTTP 1.1 or 1.0 or whatever um, is for HTTP 1. Um, so H2 is the ALPN protocol version, whatever name, whatever keyword, I don't know. I don't know that jargon. But you can actually see right here that there are request headers that show this. Yeah. Like the authority is fluvialchat.energyrock.io which is where you can go to if you actually want to go, go and join this. But we're gonna get to it in a little bit. The method here, you see colon, method, colon is get. Colon, path, colon is slash because we don't have path. 
scheme, HTTPS, which is actually another reason why uh, I want, or another thing I want to talk about. <laughs> Browsers will only use HTTP2 when on HTTPS, when using SSL which can be annoying if you're tr trying to just run a, uh, an HTTP server locally, because unless you're using it with another node application, you're probably gonna use it with a browser. You could potentially maybe use it with curl, but why? Um, there are many questions that I have for you then. But in any case, that's part of the reason why it's a little bit difficult and a little bit different. Um, using the REC and RES as well is quite a bit different between HTTP2 versus HTTP1. If we go, I'm going to not worry about that because that's the buggy version of things, or that's the buggy uh, desktop. If we go back to Fluvial, let me go to response, and I'll go to where we send. What, what is Fluvial, by the way? Fluvial is essentially Express, but HTTP2, okay. and I wrote something it. You're right. Okay. I wrote it. Okay. Technically, it sort of will work probably great, and right now it's just for projects because I consider it sort of still in beta phase. Um, but I kind of am liking it. I'm not gonna lie, I'm liking some of the ergonomics that I ended up writing into it, as opposed to how Express is doing it. But everyone prefers something different. So if it's not your thing, that's cool. But I wouldn't mind if you want to tr try and look at it. So this is kind of one of the things that is interesting. Right here, I just have this private method called send, hashtag send, because we're in JavaScript land, and that's what they decided to do for private members. Essentially, if I find that the response is HTTP version, should be 1.1, which right now I just am doing for all 1.x requests. Um, then what I do, what I have to do in order to send a response is to call this right head, which essentially builds this right here, builds this head here. <coughs> It'll take whatever headers are in there and um, send it down the pipeline. However, with HTTP2, you can see that I have to actually reach into the actual stream on the response, the, the raw response, the native vanilla HTTP2 response, and call this respond, which then includes the headers, as well as the status, rather than basically pass the status first in that. And then from there, it doesn't really matter if it's HTTP 1 or 2, you can just write to it, call end when you're done, and then when everything's finished, then it sends us on its way. So like, that is just one of the f several different handles that you need to have differently. So it's all streams? By well, technically, at least as far as Node is concerned, and probably, honestly, even beyond that, everything's a stream anyway. Um, even, in, even in Express, you can just pipe into the response stream, and that's it. Um, the thing is that because of HTTP2 and talking about like multiplexing streams and stuff like that, it's a little bit more of a thing we talk about more. When you say multiplexing streams, like, can you get it to define multiplexing? Yes. But I'll let somebody else say it because I don't know that I can explain it that well. <laughs> I'll take a stab at it. For sure. So, <clears throat> multiplexing is when you are sending uh, multiple different streams over the same channel. So, for example, uh, think of like a thread in a chat room. The chat room is sending back and forth all of these messages, so they might be multiplexed over the same communication channel, but then when they get to the other end, 
this message goes to this thread, this message goes to that thread, so on and so forth. So you're mm -hmm. tagging, you're tagging a message as it goes into a pipe, so that when the message comes out of the pipe, it can It'll go reform. to the correct bucket. Yes. And that's as opposed to HTTP one, which it's one to one. There is no multiplexing because all it is is essentially saying, here's this connection, it's already open, whoever's handling it will have the information that they're looking for, and that's it. <clears throat> the idea is that rather than um, having many different connections, like you can see, like even though you see the many, many, many network requests uh, to the same server, HTTP2 will stick everything, or as much as it can, into one socket, into one stream, rather than having them be open so separate open sockets, which is part of the reason why when you see HTTP 1, these, I, I don't know, maybe six uh, things to the same server will open, then it'll load the next six, or it'll continue to do that as it goes. With HTTP 2, that's different. It can open up many of them and download as many as can fit inside essentially that socket. I don't know more beyond that. That's just generally the idea that I get. Okay. So, so if, if you wanted to send at both, you know, the, the, the website is requesting both a JPEG, uh, say the thumbnail and a video file. HTTP2, it can send one packet that's the first part of the JPEG, then the next packet could be the first part of the movie file, then the next packet could be the next part of the JPEG, the next packet be the next part of the movie file, and it has just a little bit of header on top of each packet. Then you can download more things at once, mm -hmm. kind of. That's part of the idea behind it, At least too. through fewer... It, through fewer connections. It's concurrency. It's, yeah. it's the same thing. It, it's concurrency. It's that you... It doesn't change the bandwidth. It doesn't change what the socket is able to, to do. It just changes the receiver can listen for more than one thing at a time. And the sender can send more than one thing at a time inside of the same connection. But this is part of you know, my my question earlier was well because this is it's just different layers of abstraction. Mm -hmm. Whether you have that abstraction at the socket or you have it at the port or you have it at the message, you know this you can do it on UDP, you can do it on TCP. These mm -hmm. are all just different layers of abstraction. And so my question earlier was. Well, why not just allow it to open up 30 connections? What's the big deal? It's just a reference. But I think I actually have come to why that might be, which is that there is a little bit of overhead on the networking equipment as well as the proxy. If the proxy has to manage 30,000 TCP connections, it's at a layer of abstraction that it doesn't know which ones go together. So if you open up six TCP connections from the same client, it's going to have to manage the state for each of those six connections. Whereas if you multiplex it at the application layer, then the proxy hardware and stuff wouldn't have to manage that state and would be able to, to look at it. Um, yeah, it wouldn't have to be concerned. And that's, that's probably why they left it. Is, well, I, yeah, I was going to say, like, one of the things that I was thinking was one of the reasons for that limiting was so that um, you wouldn't, it would try to mitigate some of the denial of service sorts of attacks as well, because only so many connections can be made from one browser doing that. That means that now you have to use a different browser or something like that, rather than the same one if you are trying to hit it and assault it that way. Yeah, I don't know that that necessarily is the only thing that you can really do, but you could cause you could also cause the server to run out of file descriptors. I mean, you typically can have almost unlimited file descriptors, but like a single Raspberry Pi could open up an infinite, well, as many file descriptors as it could possibly open up for the network connection. But the mm -hmm. server, you know, so if you wanted to do a really simple denial of the service stack, which I don't think it would work with most modern software, but with older software. You could literally just have low power devices open lots of connections and do nothing else. They don't have to send any data. Mm. They can just open the connection until the file descriptors run out. Mm. I might be wrong about that, but I think that's. So that's, yeah, that it might have something to do with stuff like that. Yeah.
Sorry for derailing. It's all good. But yeah, so... I don't know where I was right before we started talking about everything, but that's okay. Multiplexing. Yes. But before the multiplexing, because I think we mostly answered. Go back to your code. Go back to the code. Yeah. yeah. It's all oh, yeah. Streams. From the streams. Yeah. And then the, the multiplexing can happen within the same stream. That's where we were. Okay. So, like, the thing is, is that many things are very similar. You can see here in my code here that it's just using the underlying stream. And so, for the most part, you can probably use a lot of the same. But because it's a little bit different and you handle things a bit differently, it's not necessarily so easy. Now, one thing that I do want to also mention, too, that I found quite interesting is that, actually it's this one I think, you actually can ask for it to allow HTTP1, which is kind of nice, because then you don't even have to use a different th thing than Fluvial if you want to use take care of both. Now, I'm saying fluvial because that's my frame of reference, but technically you could just do the same kind of thing with a simple node HTTP2 server. Allows you, it allows you to be able to do that if you want. Okay, so another question then. Yes. If we want to have a static file server, node is a bad choice. And it seems like a lot of the optimizations that we've talked about so far primarily apply to a file server, not an application. Mm -hmm. So what is the benefit for an application of HTTP2? I personally think of it as keeping everything consistent more than anything. Because many times, if you are using uh, the same essentially like Nginx server or something like that. It'll go up and oftentimes if you want it to, it will start out as HTTP2, but then because you only are using HTTP1 in your application, it'll have to translate that from HTTP2 to HTTP1. But that, that's it's the, mostly... the local proxy between, so Nginx, so right. here's the box. The box is the, the container that you're running your services in. Right. Or the orchestration layer, whatever. Nginx is a box inside that box, and your application is a box inside mm -hmm. that box. And between Nginx and the files, it's 100% HTTP2, and it's doing all the... It seems no, like I mean, really... like, there isn't even any, like, in between there. Nginx right. can do it by itself. Right, so. Nginx is doing it by itself. And then the application, meaning where you're doing your API request, you're generating right. the JSON, you're contacting the database. So the application being the thing that sits between the storage engine, the database, and the user that's getting that information and how it's going to be templated, whether it's HTTP right. or whatever. So there's your application. So it's only in between... The, the, the Nginx and the application that it would need to do any sort of, okay, we use right. the HTTP1 response headers, but mm -hmm. I'm going to translate them to HTTP2 response headers. But the browser would be speaking HTTP2 the whole time because Nginx right. would be handling Because an Nginx does that. And that's fine. The thing is, is that most people who end up using it, as it were, unintentionally, as what I say, are probably using Express on the back end and then it just translates into HTTP2 in the Nginx or Apache or whatever layer. Okay. So is that expensive, that translation? I haven't really noticed too much myself, personally. This has been, or from what I've tested, HTTP2 by itself has just been super fast anyway. So I haven't really noticed anything. And that's part of the thing is like, the whole point that I'm trying to also stress is that Fluvial is beta in part because I haven't been able to test it on a huge project or something like that to actually see if, see how performant it is, especially against things like Express. Um, oh, and that was, that was actually the other thing I was going to ask. So we typically think in request response cycle in the way that we build our applications. Mm -hmm. This demonstrates right here, just the methods you're using demonstrate that we can have somewhat of a different paradigm. It's not request response, it is, what, did, what was the name of the method? Uh, but you you can have, I guess... This one's just like the applications listen. 
There was well, there was somewhere else where you had because the normal the normal note style is uh, or is um, res dot json or res mm. dot end right. Well, so first of all, JSON is actually from Express. Well, yes, yes. Send, yes. I think, might actually be on the Send thing is itself. from Express. End is no. End is right. definitely just from that, yes. Right is no. So, okay, this one is stream.respond. Yeah. So, for instance, HTTP2 is stream.respond instead, whereas write head is how we do it for HTTP1. So does this does this change the paradigm at all in how you would write an application, or are you still just you're going to process everything and when it's all ready you just send it all at once? I mean, honestly, with the way that these streams are concerned, you don't technically even need to do that. I I don't even think you need to do that for one dot x either, because you can just pipe directly to the response stream if you want as well. Well, because yes, but it's uh, you're not multiplexing, so it's single. Right. It's single request, single mm -hmm. reply over the socket. Yes, and I'm. You still don't have to think about it this way, though, because Node takes care of it for you. Okay, so you you're still following the same pattern, mm -hmm. but your application is a little bit more efficient because even at the application layer, it's able to be sending two responses simultaneously. Basically. Right. So where you have multiple API requests going on at once, you are benefiting from the HTTP2. Mm -hmm. And for that matter, technically, one of the reasons why I started doing that is like, you don't always necessarily set up Nginx on your own machine when you're going to do development. So you will run into some similar issues with the six concurrent um, connections mm -hmm. with just that. Um, so that's part of the reason why I kind of wanted something that just did HTTP2 the whole way because that allows me to not have to worry about that either, especially since I wanted to do more with event streams. Um, in terms of Express, I have actually been able to set up event streams or event sources, whatever you want to call it, um, using just Express by itself, because HTTP 1 still supports it. But because of that concurrent connections, like we were reading on MDN, was part of the reason why it just wasn't going to work out great for anything couldn't you just implement Large. some multiplexing on top of that? Oh, know, that would like be a nightmare. Well, but like yes. in, your, in your internal application? For, the, like, for HTTP2 or? Well, it just, I, I guess the way, the way that it sounds like the value of HTTP2 is in the file side. And if, if you're rebuilding the whole thing, the, all of Express to be able to run HTTP2 on all of it so that you can go beyond the six, couldn't you just multiplex through a single one in your app, on the application layer? Like handle the, the concurrent functionality at that point? First of all, then you'd have to write it, <laughs> which is not going to be easy or fun because one of the nice things with HTTP2 is that it's handled on the node side. You don't have to even think about it at that point. Mm -hmm. It's handled on the browser side, same thing. You, if you do multiplexing in that regard, then what you have to do is you have to come up with your own header information to do that, uh, to allow for the multi multiplexing. Have it send it correctly on your application side in the server and on the front end. Well, so I'm not, I'm not saying multiplex the, the file server portion of it. But I'm, like, not, I'm not meaning so much of that either. Oh, okay. I am talking about on the application side. Yeah, of the thing is that, like, to me, I don't really see that you gain much by avoiding using HTTP2 in that regard. Um, that's part of the reason why I kind of wanted to just let the underlying implementation of it take care of it for me. Because that's a lot more work than I think is absolutely necessary for any, almost anything, really. Mm -hmm. But yeah, you could, in theory, do that. I don't think that it would necessarily... And for that matter, there's one of, one of the other advantages, too, is that HTTP2 is being handled inside of the node code 
particularly the C++ code, the C and C++ code. And so it has all of the advantages of performance there rather than you having to figure it out on the JavaScript side, which is not as performant. Or you can write a node add-on which does it, in which case, why? You're making the project that much more complicated by having two different languages that you are having running in the same, uh, in the same place, essentially. Well, very few people would need this. And from my own experience, I would not recommend it. I'd recommend using a language like Go, as in, use Go. <laughs> But the problem with that approach is that you cannot use the layers of the networking stack independently. You're getting the thing wholesale. So mm. I, I've, I've got a project called Telebit, which is very similar to Ingrock, and I, I ended mm -hmm. up having to rewrite it in Go, but the, the version that is live on the website that is the public free version that people use is in JavaScript and Node. And uh, in most, in, in the lower level languages, your HTTP module will be built on top of the TCP module. Mm -hmm. In Node, that's not the case because the TLS module is TLS and TCP. The TCP module is TCP. The HTTP module is HTTP and TCP. The HTTPS module is TLS and, or HTTP, TLS, and TCP. Which, something to note too is that as far as I understand, most of the TCP stuff is written inside of the node's socket module as well. So it is being sur it's supported by the same module, just a little bit. It's not quite the same as might be done in other languages. There, there, it's, not, it's not a wrapper. Like it's mm. The H HTTPS is not built with the TLS module. And, or the HTTP module, the TLS module, and mm. the TCP module. So when you have to go lower layers, like if you wanted to write, again, I'd never recommend you do this in Node, having had the experience. If you wanted to write a verse proxy in Node, where you need to handle TCP sometimes, and HTTP sometimes, and TLS sometimes, you have to go into private APIs. And uh, granted, no, it's it probably so much better now, because I yeah. think they have rewritten the stack recently in like, V18 or V20 or uh, there has been an effort to actually rewrite the stack, but um, it is very, very, very difficult to work in between the layers and the way that Node does it for performance. Mm -hmm. And that's actually one of the reasons why it can be so difficult to write a, a C++ add-on too, is just that it changes so much. I actually have had some experience with writing C++ add-ons for Node. But have you tried Rust add-ons? No. I wanted to look at... I actually have this Neon like... Or something like that? I have this... I don't know if that's the thing anymore. It, it isn't? I don't it's know. It's not... Well, you can get NAN, but you can... Act, there's actually like... NAN is now just a wrapper over the wrapper for Node to make it easier. <laughs> if that makes sense. An API... Nappy, yes. I call it nappy. NAPI uh, is technically what it probably is. I, I don't know. N but none yeah. of us know how to pronounce things. We, we code in our basements and we <laughs> you know, to this learn is, how to pronounce words. My, my skin doesn't get this pasty by being, out, by being outdoors. No. But no, that's, that's kind of the thing. Like, I want to play around with it. I actually have a little bit of a... I am, because I am a masochist by nature... <laughs> I actually want to write an application that uses a bunch of different languages all tied into the same thing because of all of their extensions using C++ mm -hmm. <laughs> or Rust or whatever. You, uh, Again, I'm a masochist, so. Fun with its foreign function interface. Mm -hmm. Something like that. I mean, like, I think that it'd be very funny to have like a Java or C Sharp or something application that's calling a node, uh, a piece of node code. And if Node is calling one for like Python or whatever, just because it's a cool idea, but terrible idea to implement because it's absolutely painful to do. But again, I'm a masochist. See, 
uh, see reason A. Um, but yeah, so that's the thing is like, in this case, you're just using HTTP2. It's kind of one of the nice things is that then you just don't have to worry about an extra layer at all for it. And for uh, working on it locally, you can use the event source thing basically for free. I don't know, that's not the best way to put it, but you know the idea. Event source is one of the biggest reasons why I wanted to do this because there's just so much cool about it. Now, I know that the, we probably are at the end of our time-ish. Uh, um, we can stay a little bit. I just wanted to show you this application that I'd been writing that I started on Tuesday, and I'm going to show it off because I've spent so much time on it. Gosh darn it. If you want to, go to, let me actually type in my username. Yeah. Go to that. Oh, I'm pink. Well, I'm magenta, whatever. I couldn't join a table. I thought that was for MongoDB. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's just a joke I heard. <laughs> all good, all good. I type it all. That's why! <laughs> you might need to be on your phone or something. Oh, I, I went off Wi Fi when you had that problem. So I oh, yeah, yeah. I'm on my phone. Like I was thinking, I'm not surprised. I know that with my company, when I went to the office, we were using NGROC to do local development because you need HTTPS for AWS uploads and stuff like that. And I guess we need to be on the same I know we should have been using public. Uh, Wi-Fi network? No, uh, this, is, this should be same public. Same because the, the, yeah. what happens... Not blocking like the individual... So it's, it's uh, what happens I'm wondering if it's my VPN. Uh, when you have, have it problems. could potentially. I don't know. Yeah, 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 yeah. People that have uh, like flyby. Um, I was going to be so prepared. I was going to have a QR code you could just scan. So and then, I was just saying it's not a firewall. Block it because they don't want like to have the flyby phishing attacks. And also, it allows you to get around network firewalls, which is why most things block it by default. Uh, you're, yeah, you're I can I can I can understand why no, why that what would it's be. Why? Oh, I/O. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 That's good, right? That's good, oh, yeah. Okay, so did the pictures go through? No, they did not. Oh, that's funny. It's just star, 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 star on my screen. <laughs> Ever since I saw that, I'm like, oh my gosh, people are so dumb sometimes. <laughs> but it's what? understandable because that was early on in that. You don't get the Hunter 2 reference, do you? I do not. So, there was a chat room thingy, I can't remember which one, that somebody Social made <laughs> somebody made the person they were talking to believe that whenever they put, pasted their password into oh, it, yeah. it would just be a bunch of asterisks. And so they were able to get the password person that they were talking with because they thought that it was just a bunch of stars yeah. on the other side. So, yeah, I that. oh, ooh, username B an emoji. <laughs> nice. That's good. I like that one. So I just had a lot of fun putting this example together. It's using Fluvial. One of the things that I wanted to also uh, point to, so right here, we're getting all of, the all of the messages that 
already exists, which is great, and that's just a regular uh, request response. But this, this is getting more messages in real time. Somebody send a message if you want to, and you'll see that the event stream just comes with it. It just shows up. Mm-hmm. Whoa, empty username. Colon is username. <laughs> you can tell that I didn't. <laughs> ha ha ha. Little bobby tables. <laughs> I know. Funnily, funnily enough, this is all being done not using a database. It's just using a plain JavaScript object to store everything. It is 100% memory only. Browser No. This is on the back end. So, like, the messages are all in an array. The users are all in an object. No SQL. No, no SQL. If you get what I mean. It was all just written with that. But yeah, you can see right there on the right that we, every single time a message is sent, you can see the message comes in, doesn't need a new connection, it's already got the connection open. That's one of the reasons why I wanted to use HTTP2 in the beginning. It's just that it's such a nice way to deal with it because all you have to do is listen for messages and that's it. You don't have to worry about either setting up a socket IO server so that it could potentially work through HTTP. You don't have to worry about setting up a WebSocket server which doesn't even use HTTP. Anything like that. Technically, you might have that for the first negotiation, but that's about it. So how, how do you persist uh, stuff on the back if you wanted? On the back end, if I wanted to? Mm -hmm. It could be just about anything. Did you just use that? <laughs> oh my gosh, you did. <laughs> that wasn't me. That was, that oh, who did? Who did that? I got your number. <laughs> so I also fixed it so that it'll actually wrap. Oh, it was you. <laughs> you copy paste that and it puts it away. <laughs> oh, I'm sure. I'm sure. It's kind of one of the it weirdest things about JavaScript that that actually works. <laughs> anyway, but yeah. Um, Honestly, I like some of the ergonomics that come with MongoDB, so I actually don't mind using that. If I were to do SQL, it probably would be Postgres. I don't like MySQL. I have to use it for work, but I don't like MySQL. Um, oh, SQL is the new hotness now. Oh, I'm, yeah. <laughs> I haven't SQL even. SQL is the new hotness? Yeah. It, it might be a new hotness even if it's not new. How is it the new yeah, hotness? It's, it's been the best database no, no. for, what, Lib two sequel. decades? <laughs> LibSQL is the new hotness. LibSQL, Lib ooh. Yeah. It's a fork. Oh, God. LibSQL, LibSQL? I think that's what it is. has got it baked in. It's, oh, uh, okay. Yeah, I, so, I've used the SQLite and Bun. Terso, uh, the company that's like feeling serverless. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. SQLite, which is kind of funny. Uh -huh. it's, it's already not supposed to have. So I take it you also mess around with the Beth stack? The uh, Beth? I have not heard of it. It's this bun. Bun. Elysia, uh, which is bun. Oh, I have played with Elysia. Uh, Express, and then Terzo, and HTMX. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> HTMX seems pretty awesome, though. I, I just like I I keep on fighting like there's I'm assuming yeah. HTMX is something similar sort of to JSX. No. No. no? You're okay. just serving just HTML and it's got uh, like the handlers and the attributes and then Okay. And then it's it's like almost like jQuery. It's got a just one library that you import but it's up to your HTML to Oh, I almost wonder if I've seen this too. If yeah. you've uh, been in the Rails world recently. Um, their rec like their default front end solution is mm. a similar approach with uh, Wait, really <coughs> still doing stuff? Yep. Oh. They just deleted <laughs> TypeScript recently. That oh yeah, that was crazy. <laughs> Wait, <laughs> what? Oh my gosh. We can talk about that later. <laughs> this is an interesting subject. But I want to take it talk about it now. <laughs> now. Yeah. But like, like a few days on Twitter. 
<laughs> if you want to, I can probably go through the code here, but I feel like we probably have been talking officially in this long enough, so. Yeah? Real quick, uh, uh, what was the connection between event source and HTTP2? And HTTP2? Well, right. So, event sources happen through an HTTP connection, unlike WebSockets, which is technically their own protocol. Um, however, HTTP1 only allows six concurrent connections between a browser and the server, whereas HTTP2 allows 100. I guess I guess on the code, I, I'm, I'm not making the connection between, I saw you import the node HTTP2. HTTP2. I can show how that is being done in Fluvial, but like you can do the exact same thing in Express if you wanted. It, so, with the because with the event source, you can, you basically you where do you keep because it's like a web socket, right? You keep a reference to the well, yeah, I, I've never heard the connection of object, right. and then you just yeah. call respond over and over again with sort of the uh, event stream header. It's the same kind of idea. But once the f initial response has been sent, you don't have to send the headers again. You send the headers initially, and then all you have to do is send uh, data, data, yeah, packets essentially each time that don't require extra headers. Um, essentially, what this looks like is that in this case, I'm creating an event source ID when you make it, when you ask in this case to use it as an event source oh. and then so is that is that a header what was the part where you ask it to be an event source uh this is where the as event source is if you call response or res dot as event source with a set to true or false you can technically undo it as long as you haven't first sent the first packet essentially responded essentially um then all you have is an event source ID. That's the only thing that needs to be at the beginning of each packet that you send. Right, that's how it multiplexes. Right. And then and when you go to send the event, what it's doing here is like, if, it has, if the headers haven't been sent, then it will do the whole right head thing. Otherwise, it will send the stream.respond initially. But then after the headers are sent, all that it does is writes to the socket. That's it. Okay, and that is literal text there. That is literally so, yeah. ID colon and then the event source ID and then new line and then data colon and then whatever the data is for however long the data is with a double new line. And I'm guessing that if there were a double new line in the data, you don't allow double new lines in the data? You escape double new lines in the data? I honestly haven't encountered that. That's part of the reason why I would let people to test. Yes, thank you. Be in my... Do the thing that I want you to do. Um, my evil plan is working. Um, no. You will destroy the world by your own hand. <laughs> and I mean, for that matter, like... I've not really been able to find anything on the escaping new lines in... HTTP headers. Um, it's a possibility that you could do, well, do like character header, you not header. Do. Sorry, when you go to write to the socket, um, that's all that I know. Okay, but but when when the it's is it the client that makes a request for the event stream, or is it the server that establishes the event stream? I have not There's, worked with them before. In this case, the client always has to ask for a connection. But that ask is more similar to an HTTP request than the WebSocket upgrade? Mm-hmm. Oh, and that's the router. Did, this answer, did these things answer your questions? I think, yeah. I mean, yeah. Is, is okay. the event source, is that like the NVN event source? This is the JavaScript built-in, or at least browser, Spec. Built in okay. part of the spec okay. of the what would spec or what, however you're supposed to say it's that. Like nope. Okay. This is this is the browser side of things. Oh. This is actually being used inside of the view application that I set up. 
Yeah. I don't really care either way. The thing is, Vue is pretty easy and si simple. React is simple. It doesn't really matter. <laughs> to me, I've I've gone, grown to love all front end uh, frameworks that I've used, whether or not I actually want to use them. <laughs> if that makes sense. I guess there you go. Um, but yeah. The event source in this case, one thing to note though is that if you do use that, you can't like set any headers. You can use cookies if you do the use credentials thing, uh, just like in fetch. But that doesn't necessarily work if you do, if you don't like to use cookies. <laughs> oh wait, doesn't it? But, uh, I thought this used the same connection so you wouldn't need to re-authenticate. So, because once you've authenticated the socket, then any message that comes over the socket is authenticated. I don't know that it necessarily authenticates the socket. It authenticates a request, but the request isn't necessarily the socket. The idea is that the socket is established, and then a request is sent through. That is authenticated. You have to do it but each time. Well, it's, it does not change. All that it is, is creating that socket, that tunnel, whatever you want to call it. Sand. And that's it. It Are doesn't do anything. HTTP3? They might. I don't know. Okay. I haven't looked enough into HTTP3. All I know is that it's a thing that Node doesn't yet support. <laughs> yeah, that, but they plan Because I, I will say, if, if we're using a limited number of sockets, we definitely don't need to send the API token every single time. Yeah, ideally. But... The thing is that the socket, I don't even think like, I don't know if establishing the socket actually does anything with the headers. It doesn't send headers, it doesn't send query parameters, it doesn't send even necessarily a path until the socket has been established. And in that case, now it has the path well, and now it does something with it. Right, but I'm saying the first, the first time you authenticate over a socket, so like with web sockets, for example, right? Right. Web sockets, you have to have a separate authentication mechanism because they wanted it to have the same permissions as an image tag, and I don't know what the rationale behind that is, but I know that that is literally, we wanted it to have the same permissions as the image tag. Um, so web sockets, you, whether you do it in a query parameter, you're not supposed to use the headers, even though you can if it's, you know, like if you're using a Go client and a Go mm -hmm. server, but you can't use the headers from a web browser. Anyway. So From what I've been able to, to authenticate, but once you authenticate, then the whole website is authenticated. Well, so one of the things that I've been able to tell with that, playing around with WebSockets to try to get the authentication strategies and stuff like that, like even I think MDN is the one. It suggests like you have to essentially take um, a socket and have some sort of like manual handshake that you send. You send, like, once the connection is established, you send something to the front end. The front end has to do something with it and send back. And then from that first request, when it's on the application side, you've saved something so that when the second request comes back to authenticate it, essentially, you can know that that's correct. But that's all handled on the application side of things. It's not handled on the actual tunnel side of things. It's not handled on the... Uh, networking layer. Right, 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 right. I'm just saying that I'm going to get a callback that has the connection object once I get the message that has the authentication from the connection object, I'm going to tag the connection object as authenticated and then I can check that yeah. tag every single time that I need to access that object. So Yeah, so the event source is in that it in that regard, event, the event source is actually similar to that where once you have that connection, you don't have to do that again. Okay. But again, you have to still establish the connection through that actual event source. You still have to act, handle and it are in the same way. Are we sending data up to the event source by the name of it? I would think no. We're just, no. We're just opening. So, so we're going to be doing a, a RESTful post to slash messages, mm -hmm. but we're going to Not be post, actually. It's a get. 
You can only do a get, which means there no, is no, no, no body. No, 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 no. What I'm saying is, when we want in this chat, in this chat, right? When we click submit, we're doing a restful post to a slash messages endpoint, but we're receiving everyone's messages from the event stream, not in the response to our post. Yeah, this not, is essentially what you get from it. Now, when you actually send a post request to send the message, that is a restful post, but right. it's getting it back from that. Yes. Technically, I believe that I do send back the actual message uh, in case the front end actually cares specifically about that. Right. Um, but, but this makes sense, and this is, this is how the front end frameworks have switched to doing, and instead of doing two-way binding, multiple one-way bindings, because multiple one-way bindings turns out better. So that, but yeah. I mean, architecturally, I, this makes more sense than a WebSocket does. It's, a, it's actually better designed. That's part of the reason why I've actually fallen in love with event sources. It's just that it, you don't have to worry about some of the extra stuff well, as well. Well, damn it, Samuel, I'm convinced. Thank you. And I That's why I'm here. And I did not think I would be. I, <laughs> I did not think I would be. Now I have to go learn event sources. Dang it. But now, like, for instance, I have a middleware here for checking the token. And in this case, I'm grabbing it either from the authorization header, which won't exist in an event source, um, or from the query parameters with underscore t. It's not, the, it's not the greatest solution, honestly, but it works fairly well. But that means, like, unlike with a WebSocket, you can't use, I think, that same, you can't use quite that same strategy either, if I remember correctly. Uh, okay, but can yeah. I have multiple streams over the same event socket? Honestly, what I'd probably do in a more robust application, unless I need to have something separate, I might just send all notifications through the same stream. Or... Because in the data is where you can multiplex at that layer because in your data you could have JSON and the JSON could have a tag. And... Mm -hmm. Okay. And I mean, for that matter, if you think of it this way too. Um... I need a song about layers of abstraction. What has Dylan Beetle got up lately? <laughs> <laughs> in any case, like, one of the things you could do is have separate event streams for each. Like, for instance, if you have. It's this way. If you have multiple uh, chat windows open, kind of like you could have on with Facebook or LinkedIn or whatever have you, um, you could, in theory, have separate events, event sources for each of those, as well as maybe one for just general notifications or whatever. You can also set it up to just be like, events streams are for the high availability, whereas something like notifications, which probably won't happen quite as often, you could do a polling thing or what have you for that instead if you want. Honestly, you can choose however you want to architect anything because that's the way that development is. Engineering is set up in a way that you can creatively problem solve anything and choose whatever you want to do with whatever you want, really. Yes! I reserve the right to be wrong even though I'm right. No. That's kind of one, that's some of the interesting things that I've had. And that's part of the reason why I personally like the uh, HTTP2 setup that I've gotten into. And honestly, if it doesn't go anywhere, if nobody wants to do Fluvial, fine, whatever. I think Fluvial's fun. But you're going to show us the high level API. Do you have docs for it yet? I have it in the readme, so let me go there. And in other news... It is very yellow because I have Night Shift on. Yeah, I was actually going to mention that earlier because the in the recording it comes through a bit weird. And I know, I'm sorry, I'll change that. Also, do a couple command pluses on that. That's text is a little hard to read. But, I don't know what um, you're talking about, I can read it. Yeah, Never mind. of course you can. <laughs> so, Dylan Betty, unfortunately, does not have a song about abstraction, but he does have a song about the rest of REST and all the JavaScript frameworks and the other frameworks. 
I bet ChatGPT could put one together pretty quick. Of course! <laughs> okay, write a song about abstraction in the style of Dylan Betty. They also announced ChatGPT is going to be working with the Dolly. Which doesn't surprise me. Dolly and ChatGPT okay. are both well, by yeah. the same so open AI. Both the text based and the yeah. So I think that would be huge too. I mean, it's going to give mid, uh, mid journey a run for the money. Hmm. Do they have money? Because <laughs> <laughs> the sure. they don't need to make money. <laughs> That's not, I don't know if you've been following business for the last 20 years, <laughs> but software as a service is not, a, it's, it's a Ponzi scheme. It's like, it's like blockchain. You create a company, you don't have any exit roadmap for it, but you get an investor to put their money in. Then you make that annoying to some other company, like say Venmo, Venmo did to PayPal. Then the other company that had money buys the company that had no plan to make money with that money that they had. That's literally the industry. The only thing I'm doing wrong is I never got the investors is what you're saying. Because I yes, think because I've done everything else. You shouldn't put in your there. money the investors put pressure on companies that have money to buy your company that doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> Dang it, now I need return, this. We pay the PayPal fees. <laughs> oh, wait, I'm not my <laughs> In the style of who? Uh, Dylan, Dylan Betty. Betty. Did, did Dylan Betty exist before 2021? We will uh, 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 ask COVID. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Chat GPT is like data is only yeah, fair. Oh, oh, man. Yeah, it's got several verses going. <laughs> All right. Well, it's going to take me a second to sing this. Should we finish with fl Fluvial for a second yeah, and then get into it? I want to get back to this for sure. Hey, so, you actually have a readme. I do! And it's got words on it. Yes, it does! Probably more words than people want to read, but that's why I have it! No, it's okay. You can scroll, you can get past the big block of words. And so, then, like. And then, hey, you gotta get rid of the GPL3, though. That doesn't even make sense. I don't know. I just did whatever I could find. No, do. do I could do, do MIT. MPL. Do MPL2. Oh, okay. We'll MPL2 see. is a perfectly acceptable license that gives you legal protection as the author and also is open source enough that people who are not malicious can use your code. Fair. I'll play around with it and I can update it later. And honestly, to me, I didn't really care because I feel like the license is totally fine to change when it gets to 1.0, which... I, well, just, it's, just wait until you get to critical start. mass like React and then switch the licensing, you get, uh, you know... Everything. Idea, anyone who's used it. Yes. Yeah. Well, that is, that is also a standard part of the Apache license. <laughs> <laughs> and that is a good license that does give legal protection. To, anyway. Anyway. Okay. So, like, I have this whole, like, quick start thingy. Hey, it looks like Express. Yeah, it's the point. <laughs> you, you said that with such a quaver, quivering voice. Because I didn't make it exactly like Express. Do we have res.json? That's all I would care about. Yes. All right, it's good enough for me. Send and JSON will do basically the same thing if you put an object inside, inside of it. That's it. Async handlers. Yes. Nice. What about MIME types, E tags? So I've found that that's more something that I would let a middleware do. Does it work with all Express middleware? No. Because the API is different, but I have a I have a package for you. It just so happens that I also wrote uh, an adapter for Express middleware. Uh -huh. Doesn't mean that it'll work for everything, but I've tested it with things like Passport, which has some kind of funky, Passport. crazy thing. Yeah, kind of, kind of BS. <laughs> um, I also have done it with things like Cores, Helmet. A lot of the big ones because that's the idea is that I want it to be as stable for people who want to try to try it out, as it were. Um, Does it actually use any of Express's code or is it all quadruple digit code? It is mine. I have ex I have ownership of everything. No. The thing is that, like, I've found that. 
When I was first writing Fluvial, I was looking at Express Code. I was like, I don't know if we would probably want to implement it like this today. And Express gets very complicated as you look, read through it. So it was a little bit harder to follow where things co go and where things come from. Um, as such, that was part of the reason why I just was like, I'll, I'll write something that I will understand and I can have full control over. How many dependencies does it have? One. Just for mime types. That's it. Okay. And it's really just a package. You're selling me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to keep this as light as possible. Few dependencies, for that matter, that's part of the reason why I was looking into possibly implementing it for Dino as well. Mm -hmm. Because since it doesn't require NPM packages to maintain, I don't need to worry about oh, I actually putting have it. a question yeah. the, about Dino. Have you played around with Dino much? I've played around with it just a tiny bit, but I want to look into it a little bit more, especially if I'm going to implement it for that. So Dino has um, like two kind of servers that it provides like for easy use. Mm -hmm. There's one that's on the Dino namespace, that's like Dino.serve, and mm -hmm. that one is HTTP1 only. But the so, other one, like the one that they previously recommended for everyone was HTTP2. So why do you think they would do that? They actually do have HTTP2. Uh, on the Dino.serve one? With the, you know, yeah. When I look at it... Well, yeah, like Dino does HTTP2, but this specific server explicitly doesn't support it. I'm not sure if Oak does or not. I thought that, that it did. Is that early version of Dino that you were looking at? No, so if, if you, if you but, go to the Dino documentation, I go to, like, look for Dino.serve. Is it dot? Uh, is that? Nope. No, now it's dot .com. All right, I'm ready for our epic rap battle, by the way. It is docs.dino.com. Fine. So. Uh, and then just do a search in the top right. I did. Let's see. Uh, oh, it's that one. I, I should be on the I know. Dino.serve. HTTP support is automatic when using the HTTP server APIs with Dino. You just need to create your server, and the server will handle HTTP 1 or HTTP 2 requests seamless, seamlessly. There's a... Oh, wait, maybe they did change it. HTTPS support requires that. And again, it's the dino.serve that it's talking about. Oh, so, but... <laughs> one of the things that I was finding was that I didn't love the API for how the dino.serve is as much, because I kind of like the ability the abilities that Express has to not like, for instance, Oak is kind of set up similar to Koa and how you yeah. ex you await next, and so that you can have it come back to the current handler after it's done and along the pipeline. I don't know that I really love that for everything, because that just kind of gets murky. Because like then you lose sight of a lot of where that next might be, which might work well for some things, but. To me, the express way just makes a little bit more sense to me. So what I would probably do is what it says further down with the Dino Survey HTTP, which does allow it as long as you put the LPN protocols as H2 included with HTTP 1.1. So I'll probably end up doing it that way. The way that they're doing it that way too is a little bit closer to how Node does it, too, where it does have a request object and a response object. And then what I would just need to do is make sure that there's an, ad an adaptation to the way that Fluvial is doing it, and then basically you have all Fluvial already there. Um, the biggest thing is that I need to make sure to only bring in the Node code if it's Node, or the uh, Dino code if it's Dino, which I could do with uh, dynamic imports, which I love modules, let me just say. ESM is beautiful. There's something that Dino provides, or well, it's a project that they, that, like, the team's worked on. Mm -hmm. like, DTS is what it's called. DTS? But it's like, a, it's a way to write code in, in Dino, 
that you can then like build and mm -hmm. whatever other environment. I haven't played around with it. But. Interop with Node.js npm is one of the things that I noticed, by the way. You can see there's a node specifiers thing which allows you to essentially get that read file thing from node.fs. I don't know if ETS is on but I this know. documentation. You might have it, it might not be. I could potentially look it up, though. I mean, there's the type uh, declaration files, which is not very useful. I would this. be completely wrong again. <laughs> it's all good. But yeah, I was... I was considering possibly bringing it, and I was even thinking, in my ambitious little mind, feels little sometimes, was to have a Dino version of it ready for this meetup. That was on Monday. And I didn't because that was a bad idea. Instead, I wrote a, I wrote a simple text-based chat app using it, using Fluvial instead. So... Well, that's cool. It was, it was, I, are we, are we on the end? I was ready to be done whenever, but I was okay fielding questions, so. Okay, well, I was, because I was going to say, I think it's been a great and enlightening presentation, but I didn't want to say that if we're done yet. <laughs> so I, I appreciate the, the effort you put into this, and I think that the demonstration, um, you know, it was, a, it was an excellent talking point and gave us something to, to noodle around and kind of experience. So I am grateful. Thank you. Thank you.